Let's come back to Matthew chapter 12. We're looking at Matthew 12, uh, 38 to 45 this morning. I encourage you to have those words open in front of you. I wonder how you feel when someone asks you what you believe. Uh, for some of us, uh, it's a, an opportunity that brings excitement. Uh, for most of us, I think our pulse rate rises and we imagine just how badly things could go from this point. Uh, we want to be correct. We want to get the message right, but we also want to get it across clearly. Uh, when someone asks for proof that Jesus is who he says he is, uh, is that something that excites us? Something that makes us a bit anxious? I wonder if someone asking, well, what is it you Christians really believe? I wonder if you would ever respond the way that Jesus does here in Matthew, where he calls the people who ask, a wicked and adulterous generation. Uh, it's probably not the way we would tackle this ourselves. But the fact is, Jesus is absolutely right here. Uh, these are not just people asking for curiosity for the first time. Oh, so Jesus, what are you on about? If you were here last week, you'll remember that uh, back in verse 22, Jesus had just healed a man uh, who had been possessed by a demon uh, who could not see or speak. And it's straight after this that the teachers of the law decide to say, well, Jesus, couldn't you do a miracle for us? Uh, see, it's not a lack of information that is keeping these people from believing. Uh, that's the case with many of our friends and family, isn't it? Uh, some, true, know nearly nothing about Jesus. Uh, yet many others know plenty and don't believe, even though they know so much. Uh, why? Uh, what is it that stops people who know the facts from trusting in Jesus themselves? Well, it comes down to what we value about what we think is most important in life. It's what we treasure. And we saw last time Jesus addresses our treasure in the verses running up to this. That what we love most of all determines the way that we live. And it actually spills out in the things we talk about. So what do our hearts love the most? Like the religious people here, uh, we might value religious knowledge, what we know about God. Uh, we may have made our minds up about what we believe and yet not be open to what Jesus says about us. I went read just a moment ago from Luke chapter 16 uh, about a rich man in Jesus' day who knew all about God's word. He had the writings of Moses and the prophets in the Old Testament. And yet the way he treated his neighbour, Lazarus, showed that his religious knowledge was only covering a rotten heart. Or we might be really interested in religious things, in spiritual experiences, and not be open to what Jesus says about himself. Remember it. Uh, a man my family knew when I was a kid, his name was Jim. He grew up in the church uh, that we were going to at that time. Didn't come very often, maybe at Christmas. He'd catch up with the minister for a cup of tea sometimes, but he was looking into every other sort of spirituality he could find. Uh, he tried every spiritual practice that there was and read all sorts of amazing books. It wasn't until Jim was dying that he admitted to my parents that he always knew what Jesus said was true. Jim just didn't want it to be true. He looked everywhere else to avoid seeing that what Jesus said was real. 
It would have stopped him living the way he wanted to. And it was only in those last two weeks, I think, that he turned from his spiritual wanderings and trusted Jesus was the only way, the real truth and real satisfying life, as he says in John 14. So here's the, here's the problem for all of us. What, what we love can stop us loving Jesus most of all. The, the, even the good things that we think make up our life can get in the way of loving Jesus. And we can know all about him, we can be very spiritual, and not love Jesus. I wonder what God would graciously be showing us today that our hearts value most of all, that that come out on top in our priorities, and the good things that take over our minds, that rule our hearts, the things that we turn to for value, the things we turn to for comfort, the place we run when things get hard, where we go in our minds or with our lives, when things are good. The Bible calls them idols. Things that compete with God for the whole love of our hearts. And God graciously shows us those things as he reveals to us what we truly should love, as he shows us the wonderfulness of the Lord Jesus. What we need to do is value him most of all. We need to trust that belonging to Jesus is more valuable than being approved by our friends or our family. We need to know that trusting Jesus to be the boss of our life is better than having control, wielding power over other people. We need to see that depending on Jesus is greater than any comfort money or success or anything else is ever going to happen. So the challenge today is to value Jesus as the greatest. And that's our aim as we jump into Matthew chapter 12. We want to see the ways that Jesus is great here. And that will help our hearts to love him. We see in verses 38 to 40 that he is uh, he is the greatest sign. And that's where we're going to start. And then we meet him as the greatest judge in verses 41 and 42. And finally, we see that we face the greatest danger when we overlook Jesus at the end of these verses. So look, first of all, with me at verse 38 to 40, where Jesus is himself the greatest sign. See the request that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law make to Jesus there in verse 38. They say, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, these are the very best of the religious people. And the Pharisees are the most devoted followers of Judaism in Jesus' day. And the teachers of the law are the experts in what God's word has said. And their request seems pretty reasonable. Jesus, wouldn't you do something miraculous? to prove that you are the Messiah. If we look back over this chapter, as we mentioned in the introduction, not only uh, has Jesus healed uh, the blind and, uh, and mute man in verse 22 and driven the demon out of him, uh, back at the start of the chapter in verse 13, he healed a crippled man, and right in the middle in verse 15, he was healing all kinds of illness the pattern of Jesus' ministry that wherever he goes, he's reversing the curse. He is undoing the effects of sin. So just what kind of miracle do the religious people think is ever going to convince them? They have already made up their minds before they have looked at the evidence Jesus gives. Why would someone do that? Why would we do that? Acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah, as the King, well, that would remove the power and control they have. 
They'd lose the approval of, of the people. They would miss out on the comforts they enjoyed from being at the top of the religious pile. I wonder what we would be afraid of losing. What would we miss out on if Jesus was really in charge of our lives, of our church, of our family, our work? No wonder Jesus calls them a wicked and adulterous generation. (coughs) Remember, they're the religious people, and Jesus calls them wicked. He remembers what they were doing earlier in the chapter. Remember, he heals the crippled man, and they decide to kill Jesus. He knows that their hearts are adulterous. They had promised to be faithful to the Lord their God, and their hearts had turned away to love other things instead of him. Again, we read in Luke 16 that these very people, the Pharisees, as religious as they were, they loved money. And Jesus warned them, you can't serve both. You can't have God as your master and money. And that word for money isn't just the dollars in your back pocket. It's all of the material things of this life. It could be your car or your pants or your house or your business. You can't serve both. So what would God show us graciously is competing with our love for him. What is the other master trying to rule our hearts? See, Jesus knows what goes on there. Now he's picking up on a, a picture for, of spiritual adultery that's right throughout the Bible. One of the most famous places in, is in the book of Hosea one of the minor prophets, right in at the end of the Old Testament. And in the final chapter, he gives a wonderful invitation to return to God, despite our spiritual adultery. He even gives us the words to say in Hosea chapter 14, verse 2. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously. Later, we will never say our gods to what our own hands have made, for in you the fatherless find compassion. That's how spiritual adulterers can return to God. And we get the the promise of forgiveness in the very next verse, Hosea 14, 4, where God says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. See, Jesus healing sick people was a picture pointing to the healing he brings for our hearts. The promise of God's free love and his anger turned away is fulfilled for us in Jesus. And yet good people don't like that. And good people like to be known as good people. The religious folk refuse to believe, and so Jesus refuses to indulge them. In verse 39, he answers, You wicked and and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. This takes us again into the Old Testament, doesn't it? That we we know Jonah probably much better than Hosea. Uh, The prophet who refused to go and preach repentance to Israel's enemies. So God sends the big fish to swallow him and vomit him up again. It's great stuff, isn't it? (laughs) Only afterwards, after Jonah has realised he needed to be saved in Jonah chapter 2, only then is he ready to go to Nineveh. You know how many miracles Jonah did during his ministry? It's easy. You don't even have to take your hands out of your pocket to count them. He didn't do any. Now, Jesus is not talking about a miracle Jonah did. He's talking about Jonah himself. Jonah is the sign. Notice, he nearly died inside this huge sea creature. And that is the sign that points to Jesus. 
Jesus too, Jesus the Son of Man, would die and be buried in the earth, but only for three days. And so Jonah, notice Jesus talks about Jonah as a real event that really happened in history, because it did, despite all the doubts people have about it. The real events that happened to Jonah pointed forward to what would really happen to Jesus. And again, the religious people don't like it, do they? Like the family of Lazarus we read about in Luke 16, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, including Jonah, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. So what would it take for us to be convinced that Jesus is who he says he is? We need to see who the, how the greatest sign points to Jesus, and that's our second point. What does Jesus' resurrection mean? What does it point to? Well, the greatest sign, resurrection of Jesus, points to the greatest judge. And Jesus is the central character of history, and he will be the central character on that last day. And he speaks about the men of Nineveh standing up in the judgment to condemn the generation who saw Jesus. Why? They repented at the preaching of Jonah and now something greater than Jonah is here. You know, Jonah's message was about four words long. Repent because judgment's coming in 40 days. And the way he said it, it only took uh, less words than it took me. And people heard that and repented. Or the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba, is mentioned in the next verse. She came from the ends of the earth just to hear how wise Solomon was. And something greater than Solomon is here, Jesus says. The Ninevites repented when, Jesus, when Jonah preached to them. So what does, what does repentance mean? And what is the right response to this sign? To repent is to turn around, to turn away from our sin and trust in God's mercy. And it's grieving and hating what's wrong with our hearts, as well as how that works its way out in our actions, and trusting God's forgiveness as we seek to live a new life of obedience. Now, the people in Nineveh turned from ruling their own lives to have God as their king. And so they are qualified to be witnesses for the prosecution against Jesus' generation. Because someone much greater than Jonah has arrived. And Jesus here is proving that he is God's prophet. He is the one who interprets God's word, who announces God's judgment. But he's not just one more prophet following a long line that Jonah's part of. He is the one that Jonah was pointing forward to. It's not all, is it? See where Jesus goes next in verse 42. He refers to the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South, who ruled an area somewhere around Ethiopia, who travelled over land that would have taken months to get up through Egypt and along the coast into Israel. And she wasn't there to fight. She wasn't leading her people in battle. She wasn't trading and making a profit out of the expensive spices she brought to Jerusalem. She'd come to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And so she is a witness, qualified to speak for the condemnation of the Israelites and, and of everyone who rejects Jesus. Because again, someone greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is not only the prophet, he is the king who rules and judges wisely. Uh, like Solomon, his wisdom attracts all of the nations to him. Because he knows how life is supposed to work. 
Jesus has come to reveal himself as the only way to God, the real truth about God, the real life from God. And so when we put together that Jesus is the prophet and Jesus is the king God and long expected, and then we see the word he uses for himself, back in verse 40, that he is the son of man. Going back to Daniel. He is the ultimate human being who is qualified to exist forever in the presence of God. He is the eternal son who has become one of us. Then we see why his life and his resurrection matter. In Romans 1, we're told that as he rose from the dead, it was a declaration of who Jesus is. That Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. See, who do you know who has been raised from the dead, other than Jesus? Do your genealogy and you find, oh, look, Great, great, great grandfather, so and so. No, it doesn't happen. Ordinary people can't do that. And so the Son of God, Jesus, has come, who cannot be defeated by death. We heard that, didn't we, in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, that it was not possible for death to keep its hold on him. And that was one of the ways God proved his identity and certified that Jesus is the Saviour who has come. And so the greatest sign points to Jesus, the greatest judge. What difference does that make for us? That's how we're going to wrap up this morning. The greatest uh, Jesus' resurrection is the greatest sign. And it points to Jesus as the greatest prophet and king and judge. Greatest sign points to Jesus, who warns us of the greatest danger. See, to reject Jesus is really, really dangerous. He unpacks this uh, this story of what happens when an evil spirit is driven out. And I'll just read it through for us. The when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and doesn't find it. It says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied. That's the key thing. Unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. We've seen Jesus deal with the very real problem of spiritual, uh, the spiritual problem of demon possession. We saw last week that he is the stronger man who can plunder Satan's house back in verses 28 and 29. And yet Jesus goes straight from there to say, you can't be on the fence with me. You cannot be neutral towards Jesus. If he has come with the power of God's spirit to drive out demons, you can't say, oh, I don't know what to do about this Jesus guy. In verse 30, he says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. If we decide not to do anything with Jesus, we're choosing not to be on his side. He warns us, well, we can clean up our lives. We can turn over a new leaf. We can try harder. We can be really good, <laughs> like the Pharisees were. But choosing not to be on Jesus' side leaves us open, leaves the house inside us unoccupied for spiritual deception and control and destruction. That's the danger Jesus warns of, that 
We can have a life that looks good and moral on the outside. We saw this in Titus, didn't we? Looks good on the outside, empty on the inside. Or as Paul says, having a form of godliness but denying its power. It's the only way to be secure is for the stronger man to live in our house. To pick up on Jesus' language back in verse 29. For Jesus, the great king to rule in our hearts. And he does that. He will do that for anyone who comes and asks him to live in their life. He sends his spirit. The spirit who convicts us our sin and turns us around, and gives us new life and faith in Jesus. See, Jesus' warning is very clear, isn't it? It's not enough to empty out all the bad stuff out of our lives. Escaping out the, the bad influences still leaves our hearts wide open to the danger. A half-hearted reform of trying harder will never be enough. The new, better master must come and live in our hearts. And that's what Jesus promises to do. Following him is not just receiving forgiveness. It's so much more than that too. It is recognising him as the greatest Lord. It's valuing him as our greatest love. As the one we want to follow. As the one we treasure more than anything else. And that's where spiritual safety comes from. From having a new heart that Jesus gives that turns back to him again and again. In Ephesians, it's called being filled with the Spirit. In Galatians, it's keeping in step with the Spirit. And in Colossians, we're told just what that looks like. And where it comes from. Let me read a few verses from Colossians 1. Where again we see God's word showing us how to pray. So from the day we heard about the faith of the Colossians. From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's a way of life, isn't it? The way that we walk. Fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. And here's where it comes from. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He rescues us from Satan's kingdom. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, that's the life Jesus promises to us. That's the life Jesus offers to you and me because his resurrection shows us that he is the great king. He is the wise Lord who can come and reign in our hearts when we treasure him more than anything else. So remember. Remember the examples of the people of Nineveh. Remember the queen of Sheba. They repented. They turned to hear God's word and to trust him. Notice something else about them. They were outsiders, all, all of them. And yet the message of salvation came to them as it comes to us today. That we are never too far away from Jesus. Let me just sum up as we conclude. Whatever big questions and doubts we have about Jesus, he deals with them all in his greatest sorrow, in his resurrection from the dead. It shows that he is the Son of Man, the one who came in our place to rescue us and one day sit as judge. 
And so he warns us of the greatest danger, but he promises us the greatest salvation. He promises that where our hearts are under the control of something else, something bad, something good, he will come in and be the king there. He will come and be our greatest treasure when we ask him to come and give that resurrection life to us. And like we saw last week, being the strongest man, when he has taken up residence in our hearts, no one can drive him away. Nothing can take him off the throne when he lives and reigns in us. Well, let me pray that this would be the reality in all of our hearts, more and more every day. Let's pray together. Our wonderful Lord Jesus, we pray uh, with gratitude uh, to you for, for coming as our Saviour. Uh, we can see reflect on our lives, the way that we value and treasure other things, so that we can tend to justify ourselves, so that we can look for ways to show that we are good people, religious people, moral people, spiritual people, and that we can rely on that rather than on your grace, rather than on the gift that you give us free forgiveness and new life you grant us in, in the Lord, uh, in your own death on the cross. And we thank you that you warn us of the danger of having a clean up in our lives and yet leaving the throne of our hearts unoccupied. Our God, we pray that the Lord Jesus would live and reign in us, that we would grow in knowledge of him, uh, that we would be filled with spiritual wisdom and understanding so that the way we walk, the way we live would be worthy of you, not earning your salvation, but responding to it, bearing fruit, showing that Jesus lives in our hearts. Give us strength and endurance and patience and joy. For how could we not rejoice? If you've delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son you love. So our God, Father, Son and Spirit, we praise you for your mighty salvation, for the greatness of the Saviour. We ask in his name.